Welcome to part six of Explain the Explain Plan, where we're going to talk about join methods. My name is Maria Colgan, and I'll be your host. How many join methods do you think we have? Well, it turns out we have three. Now, there are a lot more join types that we'll talk about in a moment, but there's really only three join methods Oracle uses. Nested loops, hash join, and sort merge join. With nested loops, this join method is usually chosen when the tables we're joining are quite small. You can think of it as embedded for loops. For every row in the outer table, we're going to scan the inner table looking to find a match. And as I said, it's normally chosen when we've got two small tables that we're doing joins and we have an effective way to look up rows or matches in that inner table. So in other words, normally it's an index access on that inner table. A hash join is done when the objects are larger and we have an equality predicate. With a hash join, what happens is we scan the smaller of the two tables first, we apply any where clause predicates we may have for that, and then we apply a hash func to the join column of the resulting rows and we build a hash table in memory. We then go and scan the larger of the two tables, which will be the second one. Again, we'll apply any where clause predicates we have to that. And then the same hashing function is applied to the join column of the second table. And then we do a lookup in the hash table to see whether or not we have a match. The third and final option is a sort merge join. A sort merge join is done when one or both of the inputs into the join is already sorted on the join column. So typically that happens if we've got an index that's got the join columns as the leading edge of it. So how it works is we'll actually sort both of the inputs on the join key, and then we merge the two lists together to complete the join. So it's a two-step process. And as I said, it's typically chosen when at least one, if not both of the inputs are already sorted on those join columns. And that's typically because they're the leading edge of an index. Along with those three join methods, we have five join types. Let's take a look at them now. Your traditional query, your traditional, you know, empt and dept style query uses an inner join. One where we only return the rows where there's an actual join between the two tables, the most common type of join you get in a query. You then have the option to do outer joins. With an outer join, we not only return the rows where the condition is, is met, we also return rows from one or other of the tables in that join, or if you do a full outer join, all of the other rows from the two tables. So let me step back and talk about it for a second. If I'm doing a left outer join, what it means is match everything and then all the other rows from the left-hand side where there isn't a match. The reverse is true for a right outer join. So all the return all the rows where there is a match and then all of the rows, all the other rows from the right hand side of the join, even though there isn't a match. And then a full outer join is re return all of the rows from both tables, even if there isn't a match as well as the match set. Very similar to a Cartesian product, one where we join all the rows from one table to all the rows in the other table. Per Cartesian product is typically only chosen if the objects are very tiny. So we assume only one row or no rows potentially for those objects. So if I've got stale or missing statistics, Cartesian products can pop up because the optimizer thinks there's not going to be any rows when in fact there are actually a lot of rows because I misled the optimizer with bad stats. It's also chosen if I forget the join condition. So if I'm writing a complex SQL statement and I'm joining lots of tables together, if I forget the join condition between two tables, then the optimizer has no choice but to pick a Cartesian product because it has to join all of the rows from one table to all of the rows in the other table because we haven't told it any other thing to do. The last two, semi-join and anti-joins, are seen if we've got subqueries in our query. So in other words, we are filtering out rows from the outer table by applying some kind of logic in these subqueries. So for example, they can be an exists or an in subquery, then that's a semi-join. And what it means is only return rows from the outer table where we have a match with this subquery. So this exists or in subquery. An anti-join is the opposite of that. It happens when the subquery 
is a not exists or a not in. And again, it's basically return all the rows from the outer table except for the ones that have a match with this subquery. So there are three join methods, five join types. Now that you have that information, what I was hoping to do is we're going to be the optimizer. Here's your first query. The query is a join between employees and the department ta table. We've got a where class predicate on the department table, and we've got a join predicate between employees and department on the department ID. Now, these tables are small. The employees table has 107 rows, departments 127, and there is, as I said, foreign key, primary key relationship on that department ID. The answer to this one is the optimizer chooses a nested loops join. Why? Because I've got that easy access path to be able to look up the information inside in the table on the right-hand side, we went with the for loop. Now, starting in 11G, you'll notice that the nested loops plan often show the nested loop operator twice. And I wanted to just spend a second talking about that. The reason we show it twice is that we changed the implementation of a nested loop join in 11G. And what we did was we di initially did the lookup of the index. So the join between the outer table and the index lookup is done in the first operator. And then the second nested loop operator is actually batching up the row IDs that come out of that index access so that we can minimize the number of IOs or block, single block reads we do, retrieving the corresponding row from the employees table in this case. So that's why you see the two nested loops. What about this one? I'm joining orders to order items. I have an equality predicate. The tables are larger now, um, 105 rows for orders, 665 rows for order items. I'm fairly certain it's been an easy guess for you. It's a hash join. Why? We have an equality predicate. I didn't mention anything about indexes. And so a hash join would be the most efficient way to process those two tables. All right, here's your last one. Sales and customers. I've got an equality predicate between these two tables on customer ID. The sales table has just shy of a thousand rows, while the customers table has 55,500 rows. And I do have some indexes. So I have a primary key index on the customer ID in the customer table and a foreign key index created on that customer ID in the sales table. So although I've got large tables, I have that efficient access method. Does the optimizer pick a nested loops or does it pick a hash join? Turns out in this case, it picks neither. There was actually no need to do the join at all. Why? Because we never selected any of the columns from the customer table in our select list. You'll see there, all I took was one column from sales. And because I had the primary key, foreign key relationship defined, I had those constraints in place. The optimizer was able to happily remove the customer table from this query. We call it table elimination. And the reason we're able to do it, as I said, is that primary key, foreign key relationship is defined which means there is no customer ID in the sales table that doesn't have a match in the customer's table. So therefore, I can just access the sales table, return the sales quantities, and never bother doing the join. That's one of the number one reasons I tell people, if you know information about the relationship between the data in your tables, always share it with the optimizer because it can do something very clever like what I've just shown you there. So. That's great. They told me I've got all these different join methods and join types, Maria, but what if I think the one I've got is wrong? So let's say it assumes nested loops is being selected instead of a hash join. Typically that's done when you've got a cardinality misestimate on the left-hand side. So the first table that we're accessing, if we think the number of rows coming out of that table is a small number of rows, then we would choose nested loops by default. If the cardinality estimate is incorrect, because maybe we've got a function wrapped column, maybe we're using multiple predicates on that table and they've got a correlation between them, or I simply am missing or have stale statistics, they can all be reasons why a nested loops is chosen instead of a hash join. A hash join is chosen instead of a nested loops is less common, but it still does happen. And it often happens if the rows coming out of the left-hand side of the join are actually clustered. In other words, they're in some sort of ordered fashion. 
that I could perhaps get them out of an index in that ordered fashion. And so the number of IOs needed to read that data is actually far less than the optimizer estimates. And so that can cause us to pick a hash join instead of a nested loops. And so the good news is starting in 12C, we introduced something called adaptive plans and adaptive joins methods will actually fix or help this scenario. So let me explain how that works. Let's say we're doing a two table join between order items and product information, because I'm trying to find all of the products that has a unit price of 15 and where we've sold more than one of them. I have a join predicate, so I don't need a Cartesian product. So that's there, it's an equality predicate. So I could go with either a nested loops or a hash join. With adaptive plans, what actually happens is we'll compute both subplans or both options. It could be a nested loops where we would scan the order items table and then use an index to probe into the product information table, or it could be full scan of order items and then a full scan of product information and hash join them together. So both plans are computed and are stored in the cursor just in case. And then what you see is a new operator is inserted into that plan. It's called a stats collector. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna buffer the rows that flow out of the left-hand side, and it's gonna prevent them from moving up in the rest of the plan until we see roughly how many rows are coming out. So in other words, this stats collector is put in place to buffer the rows so we can monitor what's going on. And if the number of rows that's produced by the left-hand side is less than a threshold, we go with the default plan, which in this case is nested loops. But if the number of rows we're seeing coming out of the left-hand side goes over that threshold, then we'll instantly flip to the hash join. Once the decision is made, the stats collector becomes a no-op. In other words, all subsequent executions will use the final plan that we decide. What the thresholds are, in my example, I, I said it was 100. That's not a hard-coded value. It can be, it, it is very dependent, sorry, on your particular queries. What that threshold is or that tipping point is between a nested loops and a hash join, and vice versa, by the way, I can start with a hash join and flip to a nested loops, or I can go the other way. I can go nested loops to hash join. For more information, please go to sequelmaria.com or the Optimizer blog. Mm -hmm.